Hello everyone, my name is Satvik Prasad and I am a PhD student at North Carolina State University. I'll be presenting our work on robocalls, titled Who's Calling? Characterizing robocalls through audio and metadata analysis. This is joint work with Elijah Boma Sims, Atisha Kiran Mailappan, and my advisor Brad Reeves. Robocalls are automated or semi-automated phone calls that play a recorded message once you answer them. I still remember the first robocall I received within days of purchasing a new phone number in the United States. The caller was trying to sell a car insurance scheme when in fact I didn't even own a car. Even though most of these robocalls can seem annoying, some robocalls can cause significant harm to our society. Robocallers are trying to sell fake COVID test kits and health insurance schemes to vulnerable population. In this long-term study, we provide insights about the robocalling landscape. We answer four main questions. The frequent news reports and consumer reports give us the impression that robocalls are on the rise. We look at the data to understand if the robocalling problem is getting worse. Consumer reports constantly recommend users to avoid calls from unknown numbers to reduce the number of robocalls you would receive. We conduct an experiment to understand if answering robocalls results in more robocalls. Next, we uncover robocalling operations that were responsible for a large number of these robocalls. And finally, we study some of the tactics used by robocallers to deceive their victims. But to answer these important questions, we needed data. So we deployed a large scale telephony honeypot. The principle behind data collection in our experiment was to own a large set of phone numbers and to wait for calls to be made to any of these phone numbers. As consumers to our service provider, we obtained more than 9,000 phone numbers which had a history of abuse. For example, some of these phone numbers were previously used by fraudsters. We used Asterisk to deploy our telephony honeypot and configured our Asterisk server to reject all the calls made to these numbers. We also collected SIP logs and CDR records for these calls. Our honeypot constantly evolved throughout our experiments and we added more numbers. We account for these changes in all our results and you can find those details in our paper. Next, we randomly selected 3000 phone numbers and configured our honeypot to answer calls made to these numbers. We also recorded the call audio. Further, we added more than 57,000 phone numbers which did not have a history of abuse. We configured our honeypot to reject calls made to these phone numbers. Finally, we identified about 3,000 phone numbers which received a large number of phone calls and configured them to answer the phone calls and record the call audio. To summarize, over 11 months, we used more than 66,000 phone numbers to collect about 150,000 call recordings and a total of 1.5 million phone calls. A detailed discussion of ethical and legal considerations of our work can be found in our paper. Now let us take a look at the data that we collected over the 11 months. This graph shows the normalized call volume observed in our honeypot. During the first few weeks, we observed a relatively constant call volume. But in the month of April, we saw a sudden increase in the number of calls. On deeper inspection, we observed that some phone numbers received a disproportionately high number of phone calls within a short span of time. We characterized these phenomena as storms. Further, we added about 57,000 phone numbers and continued to observe a relatively constant call volume. When we observed the weekly call volume throughout our experiment, we found that the number of unsolicited phone calls received in our honeypot neither decreased nor increased. Rather, it remains stationary. Over 11 months, we were able to uncover about 650 storm events across more than 200 phone numbers. We observed that over 90% of these unsolicited phone calls were made during weekdays and more than 80% during working hours. We saw that the call volume would increase drastically during weekdays and drop during weekends. The takeaway here is robocalling is a huge problem in the United States and there is no sign of decline. Next, we looked at one of the most common recommendations made to users by consumer forums and news reports. Users are recommended not to answer calls from unknown numbers to reduce the number of robocalls you would receive. 
we selected 3000 random phone numbers and rejected all the calls made to these numbers for six weeks. Next, we answered all calls made to these 3000 numbers for six more weeks. Finally, we computed the average call volume over these two study periods. We wanted to answer the question, does answering an unsolicited phone call have a significant effect on the number of unsolicited phone call you would receive? Surprisingly, we found no evidence that answering an unsolicited phone call would result in an increase in the number of phone calls you would receive. What this means is, even though we recommend users to be cautious when answering calls from unknown numbers, answering a robocall does not necessarily mean you will receive more robocalls in the future. Next, we wanted to process the call recordings we had collected. Our key insight here is that robocalling operations tend to reuse the call recording to generate these unsolicited phone calls. Based on this key insight, we grouped calls with similar audio into broader robocalling campaigns. To do this, we developed a five-stage audio clustering pipeline. The first stage of the audio clustering pipeline computes the amount of audio present in a call recording. The second stage identifies those audio recordings that have significant amount of audio. The third stage generates fingerprints for these audio recordings. The fourth stage builds a graph where audio recordings that are similar are connected using a graph edge. And finally, the fifth stage identifies connected components in this graph to uncover operational robocalling campaigns. We processed all the call recordings collected in our honeypot using this pipeline. We were able to uncover more than two and a half thousand unique robocalling campaigns. By manual inspection of the top campaigns, we found that the 10th largest campaign seen in our honeypot was a large scale social security fraud campaign. The largest campaign seen in our honeypot had over 6,000 phone calls. Interestingly, only a few calls were made from most of these campaigns to our honeypot. Using audio similarity to identify campaigns allowed us to study campaign specific behavior, which was previously impossible to measure. Now let us take a look at some of the strategies used by these campaigns to deceive victims. Anecdotally, we know that caller ID spoofing is a common strategy used by robocallers. We found that robocalling campaigns regularly spoof caller ID or change their calling numbers. This is a trivial strategy using which robocallers can evade allow list or deny list based uh, robocall mitigation techniques. To quantify this behavior, we define and compute source distribution, which is the ratio of number of unique caller IDs in a campaign to the campaign size. We found that the average source distribution was about 84%, but surprisingly, the top campaign had a source distribution of about 100%, which translates to a unique caller ID for every call among the 6,000 calls we found in our honeypot. We observed that some campaigns use more sophisticated spoofing techniques like neighbor spoofing, where the caller ID matches the first six digits of your call number. This deceives the victim into believing the call was originated from their neighborhood. We observed that 77 campaigns use neighbor spoofing techniques where 14 of them use neighbor spoofing for all the calls they generated. Through anecdotal evidence, we know that some robo calling campaigns randomly generate calls while others use the specific list of phone numbers. We observed that robocalling campaigns are highly targeted and a top few campaigns seen in our honeypot targeted specific phone numbers. To quantify this behavior, we computed spread, which is the ratio of unique destination numbers to the campaign size. We observed an average spread of 78%, but interestingly, the largest campaign had a spread of just under 20% which translates to about five calls made to the same phone number. While manually inspecting the top robocalling campaigns uncovered in our honeypot, we encountered two classes of fraudulent robocalling campaigns. The first class of campaigns were the social security fraud campaigns. We were able to uncover two distinct social security fraud campaigns where the caller was impersonating federal agencies in the United States. We observed that these campaigns use toll-free numbers to spoof caller ID. The second campaign we encountered was a fraudulent campaign operating in Mandarin or Chinese. This campaign was impersonating the Chinese consulate and was clearly targeting the Mandarin speaking population. 
we observed that adversarial campaigns impersonated government agencies to deceive their victims. Apart from the findings presented in this talk, we discuss many other interesting findings in our paper. To conclude, the key takeaway from this talk is that robocalling is a huge problem in the United States and we desperately need solutions to tackle them. Even though we suggest users to be cautious when answering calls from unknown numbers, answering a robocall does not necessarily increase the number of robocalls you would receive. Next, we found that illegal robocalls are highly targeted and regularly spoof their caller ID. Finally, we uncovered fraudulent robocalling campaigns that target specific vulnerable populations of our society. Thank you.